That was such a bad greeting. I chastised the audience. We haven't even started yet. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Kelly Writer's House. Uh, we have a few people to thank. First of all, the first and foremost person we have to thank here is the person sitting to my right and from your point of view to my left, I think, an amazing person who spent all day yesterday with us, just totally engaged with us, fabulous person, one of the great writers who's ever taken fingers to keyboard or pen to pad, sentence by sentence, wow, I think you're going to get a sense of that this morning, dot, 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 Wayne Kestenbaum. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Al. Seriously, we are so happy that you're here. So I think we should do that again because Wayne already feels our love and praise, but I think there's nothing better inside a writer than to feel the sound of applause. Is that true, probably? You know, I don't know. I, I could go on. I don't want to start citation right away. <laughs> okay. Anyway, citation or not, let's put our hands together again for one. That's it. Woo! And then there's my pal, Simone White, who has co-taught the Writer's House Fellows. It's the first time that I've ever co-taught it, and it's been a dream. You are so great at doing this. I don't know how you figured it out. Simone White, everybody. Yay. And Sophia DeRose, can you hear my voice, Sophia DeRose? Sophia DeRose, Sophia DeRose, yes, come in, come in, come in, come in, come in. <laughs> Sophia DeRose is the Kelly Writers House Fellows coordinator, makes everything possible, is amazing. Have you had a good time this semester? Okay, so what else is she going to say? Thank you. And Zach. Uh, in the back who's managing the tech and has one kind of difficult thing to do today, so we'll applaud Zach when that has been accomplished, um, and Alley Katz and everybody else, so it's so great that you're here. We have, there. who are they applauding themselves? Alley Katz, Alley Katz. I mean, how could you not, if your name is Alley Katz, how can you not be <laughs> the coordinator of 36 student workers? Because, it's like, so, Jing Jing, where are you? What's the, pa what's the pun? Alley cats coordinating student workers. <laughs> I know, it's like, what is it? What, the alley cat coordinating the Yeah, the thing that I just said, yes. You can't make that into a pun? It's pedestrian. Okay, you're, I think you're a little. <laughs> you're, you, Yes, that's what I was looking for. Sandy Smith, everybody, the punster, sitting next to Jing Zings and, got, and has the, the aura of Jing Jing, which is all pun. This is going to be so much fun. We have books for sale, uh, some of Wayne's books out there in the living room. So once we're done, or even in the middle, actually, if you get moved by it, you can go and buy a book, and then Wayne will be here for a little while afterwards and can inscribe your book and greet you. Do we have any of the broadsides left? Wow, do you have it with you? No, you, can you, can you, sh that was a mistake. this was handmade at the Robinson Press, we call it the 15th Room Press, anybody know why it's called the 15th Room Press, Simone White? I don't know. There are 14 <laughs> rooms in this 1851 cottage, the 15th room is across campus, it's our letter press. And it's marvelous. And the quote, which I, when it's my turn to ask a question, I'm going to start you off on this. Maybe ask you to read the passage around it. Where did you get the idea? Like, where the hell did you get the idea that anyone's relation to literature could come without fleshy exactions? Fleshy exactions. Amazing. Here, I want to give this back to you in case, you know, it gets creased or something. I so think, uh, I think in the original it's fleshly. Uh-oh. But... I, did uh, but, we but make I'm, a mistake? The I'm letter really press happy people with fleshy. made. A fleshy, fleshy is much less. <laughs> fleshy is more daring. I think. Fleshy is sexier. Fleshly implies violence. Violence. Yes. It oh, does. but the rest of the paragraph is a, is a. Anyway, we're going to get to that. So what we're doing here is um, we're here to talk. Uh, it'll be about an hour and five minutes, an hour and ten minutes. We respect the fact that this is a weekday. Many of you are playing hooky from work. I want to acknowledge that have, we have a large audience of people who are watching us on the live stream via YouTube. They, too, are skipping work. They're probably sitting at their desks. We want to say hello to everybody around the world. I know a number of people who are in far-off time zones. I got some emails from people who watched last night's reading, which was amazing. 
Um, so hello to your, that audience. And if you want to put some questions or comments in the YouTube chat, you're welcome to do so. Um, our Cracker Jack team back there will take a look, and if there's something really interesting, they may wave to me. We may not have time to take your questions, but we will gather the chat as text and make sure that Wayne sees the chat, so all those questions will be there on the table. So what we're going to do is we're just going to, for a while, Simone and I are going to go back and forth alternating questions and comments about passages, and we have a clip for you, and then we'll turn to you for some questions, and then it'll be back to us. And so, Simone, do you want to start? Sure, I can start. Um, I would like to start with um, the question of acemic writing, which comes up. Oh, is that a good one? To start? Oh, good. Okay. Um, it comes up a few times in Figure It Out. And one of the places it comes up is in the essay Corpse Pose. I'm just going to define acemic, as you have, as writing that doesn't use words or signs. So I'm wondering if you can. Um, Read. Can you read a little bit, and then we can talk about this. This is from page 83 of a different essay, the essay No More Tasks, where you mm -hmm. say some pretty incredible things. This if you could incredible start passage. after Eden, and maybe just feel it out, see where you were. How far, how much should I read? Whatever see you, how feel you feel like. Okay. Yeah. Um, can I start a couple of sentences yes. earlier? Okay. <laughs> just, okay. No more masks, no more mythologies. So goes the passionate cry uttered in Muriel Ruckheiser's The Poem as Mask. No more tasks, I say, cross-breeding Ruckheiser's phrase with Sontag's or Manet's no tasks. Mask and task are two nouns, two behaviors I love. From Oscar Wilde come masks, from the Marquis de Sade, and from Yahweh come tasks. <laughs> After Eden, masks and tasks after Eden, masks and tasks. In Eden, we had neither. Literature, the respite of the fallen, is the process of making do with mask and task, diverting ourselves with tasks that mask our disenfranchisement. We are disenfranchised regardless of our station because we belong to an earth that will continue to bear our presence only if we remain adequate custodians of this material envelope, fragile, in which we dwell. An envelope consisting of just a small interval of habitable temperatures. To unmask the systems that will destroy our possibility of inhabiting the earth is the task of a language that operates through masks, and the avoidance of tasks. One more sentence. Past the obvious tasks we fly in search of tasks more stringent, more personal, more flawed, more seamed, more circumvolutionary. Mm. Mm, wow. Prose poem. Oh, yeah. I wanted to say, you said last night that you were a poet, primarily a poet, and this is a demonstration of that in so many ways, but also... This is the cosmic Wayne. Oh, I'm so cosmic. That's oh. didn't I mention yesterday that I always have the Bible card up my sleeve? <laughs> <laughs> Not literally, folks. So maybe literally. <laughs> so how does how does this passage help us to understand what acemic writing means to you? Well, acemic writing we assume came before writing. Though acemic writing before it's like before there was writing to to other Acemic writing as acemic, maybe acemic writing thought it was writing. I'm assuming a chronology or a teleology that is maybe bogus, where there was, it's like matriarchy, for, before patriarchy, matriarchy. Maybe there was first acemic writing, a writing where there was simply the urgency of inscription and maybe an urgency uh, motivated by a wish to inscribe more than one thing at the same time mm. thinking forward maybe of course to emily dickinson's multiple read multiple versions of the same line so i'm i guess i'm i'm speculating that acemic writing is not a writing without signs but writing with so many signs mm. that it uh uh electively mutes itself mm to convey the surplus, but acemic, so I, 
I've been thinking about, I obviously came into my own as an asemic writer when I started painting in 2010 because then I experienced literally uh, the pressure of graphite, pastel or whatever on a paper without without words. But certainly from the beginning of my language acquisition, I was feeling the possible uh, severing, decoupling between the wish to impress and the wish to signify a specific thing. And I do like in teaching and in re I like to feel out or feel for the asemic energies in a text I'm reading, in a life I'm trying to guide. I am so, I'm interested poetically in the idea that there is no separation between the idea that a word is exploding upon itself and also its very specific self, which is so present in every bit of your writing. And I just, I don't even know how to talk about it. Maybe the next example you bring will be able to see some of this. But, for example, list making, right? The ways in which you investigate all the words in Samuel Beckett's unnameable that you don't know and allow that to become the basis of this beautiful essay about what you don't know, right? Did you want well, to let's. Uh, I was going to go somewhere else, but I love I love list making. Let's stay with it. Okay. So I want to give you f quickly a few examples where you not only make in your writing, not only make what we would call meta textual reference, meaning you're referring to the thing you're writing right now, mm -hmm. but it's more specifically about the way you are a list maker in the writing itself. Even though you're writing about, for instance, queer life in the 1950s, which for various cultural reasons tended toward cataloging, organizing, domestic lists, and so forth. So I give you a couple of examples, and the last one I, have a, I want you to, to help me with, okay? Um, in, uh, in The Queen's Throat, on page 29, for those following at home, you say, because this book is my scrapbook, because as an opera queen, I stand immobile inside a crush, and because a crush is composed of useless fragments, comma, I give you these pieces without commentary, and we get a list of Anamafo stuff without connection, so it's just a list. Uh, and then at the bottom, getting to Cosmic, these clippings have a prismatic, shattering power. Uh, earlier in this book, you say that list making is a prophylaxis against loss. Uh, also in this book you say that collage is a technique that gay artists have found useful. And here's the one I want to cite and then ask you to say something about. It's also in this book. It's on 113. My favorite passage in the book. You're talking about bringing roses for a diva. Some people do. They come and throw it, toss it onto the stage. You say, I have never bought roses for a diva, and maybe that means I'm a selfish fan. Or maybe these fragments are my roses. Flowers for an imaginary diva, for the identity of diva, toward which, against reason, against gender, I aspire. So my first question about that passage is, okay, so the analogy is Wayne to the diva gives roses, or rather, the thing I'm writing are roses, so who's the diva in the book? Is that, would that be us? Are you giving us roses that, what's going on there? Can I see the book? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are roses in this book. You've given them to us. What strikes me, I mean, this doesn't really directly answer your question, but since I haven't seen this passage in 20 years, as mm. far as I know, so I'm reacting to it as a total stranger. Pretty great passage, Thank isn't you. It? Uh, no, I don't know. I, I love deeply that you love it, more than I can say. Can you <laughs> say more about that? <laughs> I I, <do. laughs> I, I, I got, you gave us roses. I don't. We're I, divas, I, I think. Know, I, I am you made us you, divas. But I'll just say that the, the, what I am feeling in here is I'm wondering why, and I know why, I wonder why I didn't have the temerity or imagination, bravery at that moment to 
stage uh, to to invent a scene where I am giving the roses? Why do I stop at the threshold of the not giving? And why do I why do I close the door against a life of giving roses when, in fact, as you wonderfully articulate, I am giving roses. So why do I cling to the the identity of he who does not give roses? And but, that seems a real, and I think it's because I don't have a lot of room in this book or in this paragraph. Well, you didn't give yourself enough freedom at that point. I it's a long time ago. It's I needed, and I'm thinking, incl- I'm thinking of Our Lady of the Flowers, Janae, and I'm thinking of the kind of room that would, if I were writing in a more circumvolutionary style, I could have had room to give the roses and to talk about why I'm he who does not give roses. Here's why I like the early Wayne. I like the later Wayne very much. But the early Wayne doesn't quite have the nerve to say, in the back of this book, I've pressed some roses for you. Or here's my Instagram, send me a DM, and I will get together and I'll give you a rose. Or I don't want to do this anymore. I want to draw roses asymically. Right. That's the later Wayne. Right. The early Wayne is more meta because this is your limit right here, this book. Mm-hmm. And so you've given us roses and yeah. we're divas. Yeah, I love... Uh, thank you for differentiating early Wayne and later mm-hmm. Wayne. And and I... Yeah, I, I do know... I mean, we you know, for somebody who follows Henry James but can't send him in a DM to give him the flowers... Too bad. What, what early and late style mean in that way have mm-hmm. to do with the descent into an impossible Lageria. But... I mean, and I love Lagari. It's like the it's like well, the, and it's the other side of the AC. Never coming to the point and sentences. Yeah. Also, in the early Wayne, one of my favorite things you say in the Warhol biography is this thing about interpersonality, which I take to be just like a word for relations. You say that Andy discovered that the thing about interpersonality was that objects coldly greeted each other, and that they were alliances freaked with hostility. I stand is, by that. Is that true still? It is true. I, I read last night a passage from an essay about the artist Forrest Bess, and mm-hmm. I talked about trying to rationalize or ex- rationalize the adjacency of blobs, blue-black blobs in mm-hmm. a certain abstract painting, and I talked about how I wanted, in a way, to celebrate their adjacency and notice the coldness within, not try to... to fix their adjacency in a story that might uh, remove hostility from the tincture or just strangeness. So I guess this notion that I think I'm talking in that Warhol passage about his later work, yeah. his, his, you know, eggs or crosses or just like objects kind of lumped together like an mm-hmm. unhappy family mm-hmm. or a co-op or something. <laughs> and, 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 but the, <laughs> the muteness and chill of their nearness and they're not touching. Is for is the recipe for ecstasy all the time in the visual? Mm. What I mean is that just I mean I'm not saying I'm always in a trance and always happy, but it, I think that if you look visually, optically at the world and you notice when things, when forms overlap and when they don't overlap, there's a lot of philosophy that happens in that kind of watching simone yes you want to should we do the clip or do you have another Let's one do the clip. okay yeah. uh zach is going to get a clip together i'm going to take the sun out with a shade here and we'll turn the lights off it won't be the perfect viewing should we get out of the way i think we might have yeah apologies sorry so sorry so we won't be able to shut out all the way. Mm-hmm. 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 Mince your air. All the way? No. Oh, 
if you were on RKO time, you could just mince, mince your errors. Sort of RKO potage. Just uh, mix it up, make a veggie burger of your errors. Then consider yourself stymied for life. Consider that the box you dwell within is kaput. Kaput. I learned, I learned German. I learned German at an early age at RKO. I had fine teachers, Dietrich. Dietrich taught me articles. Dietrich taught me the basic conjugations. Past perfect, present perfect, future perfect, future imperfect. Dietrich taught me how to pretend to be heartbroken, how to fold in half at will, how to box, how to be discomforted by weather and co-stars, how to flip to the B side, how to the drug that you were offered, how to butt into, Dietrich taught me how to braise, laughter is God's penicillin, Dietrich taught me that tears were the lubricant of the gods, nobody on the hill understood how to make Dietrich. Good evening. Good evening, you little shits. Got some news for you. Got a lot to tell you today. Something to do with how to, how to make good on your primal hungers. Do you want to make good on your primal hungers? Just turn your hunger. Did you choose that, Simone? I did. I applaud you for going beyond the bounds of what Instagram would allow me. Which is now about 10 minutes, right? But no, I mean in terms of uh, oh, yes. nudity. Oh. oh. I mean, because that, I made that film for a screening in L.A., so it's 12 minutes long, so it's, it, it was made not... Most of my films are kind of, are aimed a little bit at the... at an posting them on Instagram and so I wouldn't have full frontal nudity for right. example and I wouldn't have that that length and it's also really it's such a pleasure for me to see this on a bigger screen rather than on my phone it makes me really happy well so I'm you. just completely delighted by all of these films and I don't know if I have a question except I guess what I want to say about why I find the films delightful and then maybe we can talk a little bit about how you came to be making these films um, they have everything in them. And the, one of the reasons I wanted this clip was that you pop up for a millisecond in the corner being yourself Thank instead oh of October. God. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> the chorus. So much in the tableau. Mm -hmm. And I am just curious about how this came to be um, your current working practice. Well, I, it, it has to do with list making in a way. I, I think that the, or, and the questions of pleasure taken in adjacencies that don't have a narrative announced. That the adjacency, in other words, and I'm talking about like within a list, item number one, item number two, within a poem, stanza one, stanza two, metaphor one, metaphor two, within a film, clip one, clip two, or even simultaneous images, within a paint a semi-representational painting, the, the nearness of blob one, blob two, or color one on top of color two, or it, you could even say the adjacency of the citation where, oh, this odalisque reminds me of that odalisque in the past, and so you have a, a juxtaposition. But all those juxtapositions, what's beautiful about them to me is they're something accidental about them and that it's the task of the reader or the viewer to 
not rationalize the nearness, but come up with a feeling state to bridge the two. So filmmaking, or whatever you call this kind of personal cinema, mm-hmm. video art practice has to do with enjoying the fact that clips can be next to each other and that clips can contain words and that the the relation of next to the relation of adjacency or contiguity is a syntax and that it is it's not the same in language and film but language and film have in common their reliance on time and therefore a word something that happens first and then something that happens second or something that happens nearly at the same time and so playing spatially graphically audibly with film clips that I make or find and then playing with systems of alteration that are manifold in video making apps I use Premiere Pro which is just like a source book of wonders of things you can just do colors you can add things and then soundtrack and what what I the making of this soundtrack was a discovery for me it was the first I think the first time I had done this is that I I I took my recorder and I I think at the piano I might have played various phrases from Debussy or I might have improvised but in the in the editing I edited out any attack or initiation of a note and I only kept in the recording and in this score the after effect of the sound so that there's but there when you cut out the initiation of a note you still have when the when the aftermath of the note originates on the soundtrack it still arrives as a kind of attack but it's muffled and so there's these series of harmonics that are just the piano strings vibrating with the pedal down but they are but they they kind of instead of being ba 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 they're And I, that cloud effect is more Debussyan than anything I could pianistically manage. So I'm, and I also then it was so fun and f- to do the soundtrack because I made those little oh, little things happen not when I was speaking but in the interstices between words. So that was like a new form of oh, uh, so kind of Amazing. dancing with yeah. words and music that was really fun. Well, we can so even well talk described. about the sort of, I don't know whether these are scripted or not, but there's also, I have a sense that there's also... No script, No, baby, they're no improvised. And so, and so you're, <laughs> you're acting, and there's also this element of your fiction writing which comes, mm-hmm. right? Because you're this character who reappears. I, oh my God, it's amazing. Thank you. People can find it. Just go to yeah. Vimeo yes. and search for Wayne, and you will, you will find a number of these. Um, can we, so you are probably the most referential writer that I've read, certainly recently. You love that. You're also fun. <laughs> One gets a sense, once again, a sense that of you as a writer and the person writing. You're fun. And you're also quick. I mean, you, uh, in conversation. So let's play a game. Okay. So I, I will say a name or a concept or a thing. God. And it's going to be hard <laughs> because so it's going to be hard because you know these are big topics. So I'll start. Jimmy Schuyler. Jimmy Schuyler lived on Twenty Third Street. Uh, a, a day that is a sequence of little nothings. Queering the Pollock, the Jackson Pollock myth. So easy to do. <laughs> so easy to do. But it's also cheating because you have that kind of, we mentioned brick and cat on a hot tin roof yesterday. It's so easy to just lump together all alcoholics and, and just say that. I'm so glad we're recording this. <laughs> no, it's just so easy to say, you know, once get, get a couple of vodka stingers in, in a guy and he'll go south at her marriage with Blake Edwards. Rudy, Rudy Giuliani in drag. Gross. Just <laughs> disgusting. What a disgusting barnacle of a human being. <laughs> Academia. Academia, it's, it is, I like being paid to be myself more or less, but I do wonder if, I wonder how my voice and way of working creatively in the world would be different if I had, from the beginning, chosen to find another way of making a living. 
San Francisco versus New York City. There's not enough stucco in New York City. (laughs) I have a dream, though. I have a repeated dream that there is, that there's a whole row. It's like the Sunset District in San Francisco, that there's a whole row of stucco pastel houses along the west, uh, along the Hudson River. I like this game. This is going well. (laughs) Schindler's List. Such applause. And I just wondered what it was like to... I just wonder what, in a lifetime of performing, if you're feeling it in the small of your back, Mm -hmm. what those oscillations feel like. Mm -hmm. Susan Sontag on camp. I was, we were talking about this the other night, that that if a big faux pas, I think, would have been maybe in the year 2000 to say, uh, um, Susan Sontag, I love your work, Notes on Camp changed my life. And she would say, of course, have you read nothing of mine since yeah, then? Exactly. <laughs> Quote unquote. Princeton. It was a kind of easy PhD program, and I'm grateful for that. It was only four years. <laughs> uncomplicated. Really uncomplicated. Very uncomplicated. I think I was nervous the first semester because I had not read any theory. And I was turned out nobody was interested in theory there no, anyway. But the, at the that students time. were the students the, were very interested in theory, and the, there were there were only really two years of students taking classes. And the second year, students were very invested in theory, and they were talking about literature in a way I didn't understand. But I'll tell one more Princeton story, which is that when I arrived, uh, somebody said to me, a fellow student said, "So you're a modernist?" And I actually I didn't know what he was. I thought, how could I be a modernist? Because Modernists were in 1922, and I didn't understand. I didn't know that you could be called a modernist if you worked on modernism. But that doesn't make you a modernist. Wait till we get to architecture. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if we're at ar- going to architecture, but that might happen in the Q and A. Two more. Mm-hmm. Two more. Andy's decision to bring the Velvet Underground to the dinner annual meeting of the Psychoanalytic (laughs) Society. One one of the the many, many ways that he, you could say, staged political interventions without getting full credit for it. Mm. Yeah, totally. Tony Kushner? Tony Kushner, very, very, very sweet, generous, uh, dear, radiant human being. One more, uh, Super 8. Well, now that I've discovered six, 16 millimeter, I understand the difference between Super 8 and 16, but I grew up with Super 8, and I've returned to Super 8, and it, there used to be a magazine called Super 8, mm. and that breaks my heart that I didn't subscribe to it when it was available and that there isn't a magazine called Super 8. Could there, is there, I don't, I think whatever kind of community formation there might have been when there was a magazine called Super 8 is just lost. And I don't want that to sound like nostalgic, like, oh, that those were the good old days. But I would like j- just to, have a moment of silence for the moment for the time when there was a magazine called Super 8. Oh, hell, one more. <laughs> this goes back to our... We didn't know each other then, but we were growing up at the same time. Annette Funicello. Mm. Anybody know Annette Funicello? Yeah. Oh, good. Good, good, good. M-I-C-K-E-Y. Yeah, yeah no, what's, what's really... And, and it, it's kind of like a, a, Annette Funicello and Anna Mafo are obviously very similar culturally or something. And Connie Francis would be another one where there are uh, Philadelphia, here we are, where there are uh, Italian, first generation, second generation, pretty vocally talented, very eager to please uh, Italian young women in urban areas who discover ways of being stars. Wasn't he great at that game? Thank you. That was just writing. That was writing. We co-wrote, yeah, right. we co-wrote it, and we'll, we'll get the we'll get that clip. Um, Simone, a question from you, and then we'll turn to the audience for questions. My question doesn't take too long. I really, oh. I have so uh, many questions. Sure? We'll do. I'll do one. Go ahead. I want it so bad. I That's have, okay. 
I have so many questions about how it is that you decided that you were an artist. What happened? I just want to know what happened to you. Because, be, like, what happened before 2010? This is a, such, I want you to write another book about this. But. Well, I would say, I mean, one thing that turned me into an artist, I want to thank Mary Frances, who's here, a dear friend of mine, uh, who published my book, The Anatomy of Harpo Marx, uh, when she was a film and music editor at the University of California Press. Mm. And that book was a really, you could say, a labor of love. I mean, it was really, it was a mask and a task, but an enormous undertaking for me. And it involved, and I wrote it between, I think, 2008. It was published in 2012. And so the writing of it was maybe 2007 through 2011. And that involved a, an obsessive annotation of film stills of Harpo Marx. And I took the stills, my, I would watch the movies on my, my computer, and I would freeze the frame, and I would take a picture with my little Olympus digital camera. And so I had hundreds of these pictures, and, and I wrote the book by doing like ekphrasis on those photos. Mm. And then when, it came, when I was fortunate enough to be able to publish this with the University of California Press, Mary and I realized that we couldn't use those photos Legal, for many legally? reasons. They just, no, they just were maybe legally, but they, they didn't have the right resolution. They were too, they were blurry. Mm. And they were kind of oddly colored from the yellow light in my room. And so, and I, and I didn't know, the reason I took those pictures with my camera is I didn't, th those DVDs were protected against screen grabs. But, we figured out a way to do, a legit way for film historians to do screen grabs off of those kinds of things. So I went back and I did screen grabs of those exact images. This is getting back to how I became an artist. So I did, and so the, but the, I realized doing those screen grabs then that it was sometimes impossible to find the exact moment because digital media isn't, it, it depending on, all sorts of things about the quality, I guess, of the DVD or, or whatever that you can't find. It, it's not the same. It's not a film still. It's a, it's a grab from a digital. And so sometimes I could not grab the, th the image purely. It would have glitches in it. And so it, I couldn't sometimes get the same image. And then I realized that I had also been annotating images that were stretched. And that when I did the screen grabs, I real first of all, I, re I talk a lot about Harpo's wide face. He doesn't have a wide face. That's because I had it on wide screen. And so I, so I guess I'm saying that this was really, str and then I, I think from that, the exhaustion and obsession, but also the, immer the, the, the loving immersion in that process, I think taught me that I wanted to work directly with images. And so it, it was. It was that. It was that. And it was also then writing the book Humiliation, which I wrote at the same time as the Harpo Marx book, and published in 2011, which chronicles a kind of exhaustion with the posture, with various postures, including the posture of the writer, the performer, the child. You know, many of those things. And I think that that the combination of the Humiliation book and the Harpo book led directly to wishing to actually experiment with watercolor. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. Watercolor first. It seemed the easy, it was the cheapest and it was, I didn't have, and I just went to the art supply store and I thought, well, what do you do? You get a watercolor set. <laughs> so can, can we snaps for Mary who edited this yeah. thing? And yes. And is now here at the University of Pennsylvania Press. I yes. just thought I would say that for all the writers in the room who are now going to bombard <laughs> Mary after the event. Um, let's turn. We have uh, time for a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, who has the portable mic? I can get it. Madeline Song, Madeline Song, Madeline Song. Oh, Simone's going to do it. Okay. You were the first one. Put your hand up. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about Susan Songtag and her wonderful blurb for your book, The Queen's Throat. Did you know Susan, and did she ever yell at you? I didn't. I, well, I, when I got the blurb, I, you could say I got it completely legitimately. I had never met her. My editor 
sent her the book because she had chosen an essay from it for the best American essays that the part it had been in, in the Yale Journal of Criticism. So the fact that she even found it, a somewhat obscure literary critical, you know, academic journal, she had plucked it then. And so then she was sent the book and she blurbed it. And I, I think we exchanged notes, but you know, that was it. I later heard from mutual friends or whatever that she was miffed that I didn't <clears throat> like call her to thank her or something like that. And that was like my first taste of something else in the water. But I, it was so nice to really revere her and have her as a role model for a hygiene of the sentence. Yes, kind of. Definitely and, that. And I really loved it. But the times I actually met her, we actually lived in the same building in New York after. Like a decade, I moved to this building in '97, so like five years after the Queen's throat, and we had a few encounters. One of them was very lovely, and we had a phone conversation. And I regret that we then never had the coffee that we were going to have, but she certainly did yell at me <laughs> when but I first met her. Before yelling, wrote a brilliant book, an ecstatic book, inevitably an elegiac book. And one which, like some operas, certain voices has the capacity to provoke in this reader and opera lover anyway, admiration, rapture, identification. That it doesn't get any better from Susan Sontag. Mm. I nice, was very nice I'm going. still happy. Nice I'm still going. happy. All right. I think Sandy has a question and then we'll go to Eric. Sandy asked the best questions. Let's see if this is up well, to stuff. Actually, two comments and a question. The first comment is, I am impressed uh, not having actually seen or heard you before. I believe that I have just witnessed what hip-hop would have been like had academics, rather than Boys in the Hood, created it. Hmm. Huh. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. We're going to have to digest that. The second thing had to do with Princeton. I was thinking, though, about the borough, not the university. It exam exemplifies a concept I refer to as terminal charm. Mm. <laughs> That's why you got out of there so fast. Well, I wasn't even really in it. You I mean, I was, I was enrolled, I, but I lived in New York. Okay. I spent a few nights there, yeah. but I still a remember. A few <laughs> nights. <laughs> I know. I had a, I had, there was a residency requirement, so I had a... Seriously? Yeah, there was, for, and I... And I called the dean before I matriculated, and I said, can I live in New York? And she said, I know what you're up to, or something like that. I swear to God. Princeton. She said, I know what you're up Hello to. Hello to all the Princeton fans who are watching on YouTube. And so I, I, I had a, 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 I paid like $10 a month or something, or $15 a week, or something like that for this address. But then, I don't even know if I ever paid. That was that kind of, so it was a kind of a nightmare, and then I just stopped showing up. So I, still, I spent just a few nights. Uh, and now your question? Yes. Well, <laughs> I did warn you I would ask this. Okay. So I don't know. It architecture? May, no, it's not about architecture. But it probably does reflect the part of the country I grew up in, which is famous for a certain cash crop. Um, since you're an expert on the Queen's English, can you verify that Oscar Wilde really did say on his deathbed, either that wallpaper goes or I do? I can't verify it. I've heard it a lot too, and I love that he said it. But I, I love that he said it. But if you mean verify, you mean be a historian and know whether it's true or apocryphal. I can't. But it but got into beautiful. the record today, and that's all that counts. <laughs> Eric, thank you, Sandy. Yeah. So I have uh, two questions. One very quick, and then my actual question. So just based on on that game, and also Al's other class that he teaches. Uh, how would you re react to uh, Come and See, directed by Elam Klimov? Wait, how would I react to what? Uh, Come and See, directed Come by Elam Klimov. Come and See? I don't know it. Doesn't react. So okay. that's, I'm really sorry to just pass on it's, that one. It's perfectly fine. <laughs> um, all right, so the actual question was, uh, given your emphasis on performance in reference to the artist, especially in regards to the physics, of the performance in the context of the space in which it is occurring, especially in the context of your discussion regarding the body. How do you feel uh, in terms of that sentiment regarding the audience and the reception of the performance they are witnessing? Well, in terms of my own work, as you say, since I am a primarily a poet and work in somewhat recherche genres and modes of speech, I don't, and this is like, 
this is all, this is great. This is rare and and worth living for an audience like this and the one that I've had here for a day for, for yesterday, but that I work very privately. You know, in other words, I'm most of the time in my perform even my my visual performances like or my films performances, I'm alone in my studio or whatever and I post them or whatever on social media or like twice I've screened them in person. But it's all happening by myself and reactions I get are by proxy and from a distance. And so I don't the kind of performer I am, whether on the page or in media or in person, is not much of a performer, you know. It's pretty. It's a pretty private thing to be a poet and a writer. In terms of real performers who get up there and have huge audiences, and are very recognizable, I'm constantly wondering. You could say about the ontology of star inwardness, and even of performer inwardness. And it's it's chutzpah of me to be even playing these thought games. But I, I wonder, you know. So what did Judy Garland feel when the Carnegie Hall concert was over? Like, mm -hmm. not just sentimentally what we picture her, what's the, like, you know, how are we going to do the establishing shot of Judy in her hotel room with the booze or whatever and the pills <laughs> after, but what does it internally feel like? Mm -hmm. Emptied? Mm -hmm. Un like, what, is it, what does it feel like to... Re to be in that with that kind of cathexis with an audience and to have it replay earlier cathexis mm. what's the experience of that and maybe it's a and that's what i've been thinking about my whole life really is what the and what does it feel like inside to be seen can you get heard? the tingle at the bottom of your spine by writing something great alone in your room um it's not, I, let me think of what it, I mean, I always. I think the, you can. Le mot juste feels really good if you're feeling you did it. And that's why revision can, be, though arduous, can be really fun because if crossing out the words or whatever and then you find the word that's just weird enough to please me as I do it, that's very fun. Like ending a sentence with circum volutionary, which is not my word, it's Beckett's, but the feeling of putting a period after circumvolutionary <laughs> is a, a bottom of the spine feeling. But it's, it's language's spine that I'm, that's getting the... But it's still the same feeling that Anna Moffo had on stage, presumably. Yeah. A cousin to it. Yeah, no, it's, it, but that, that's what I'm imagining that Anna Moffo felt. I wonder what it... I, I notice in her live recordings that the, a certain hastiness in the taking of breath, the, in taking of breath and that maybe the ends of phrases are a little truncated and and I just I think of how many roles she learned so quickly and what what uh, how stage fright would have been factored into that remarkable amount of vocal and intellectual uh, facility that she had yeah I, I, okay yeah let's go back to is it Zelda who has a question? Zelda, will you stand up? Uh, everybody who was here last night, Zelda gave a fabulous introduction. And even if you weren't here, you need to put your hands together for Zelda. Uh, this will be our last question, and then we'll come back, and Simone and I will finish with a few more questions. <laughs> okay, um, good morning, Zelda. Good morning, Al. Um, I have two questions. One is that um, I have read a little bit about, like, shame and kind of how like it presents itself in writing like in a workshop it workshops can like operate around shame and like publishing can do all that too so i'm wondering what for you is the difference between humiliation and shame and then also um how like what what does it mean for you to like inhabit humiliation mm. well <coughs> I'll tr I'll try to dance on the surface of that question rather than reenact it in any kind of way. To, to, the way when I wrote the book Humiliation, the way the perhaps glib way that I differentiated shame from humiliation, I imagined that shame referred to the feeling state, not necessarily to the set of circumstances that provoked it. You could say there was an, that he shamed her. So there is then a perform. There's a thing that's happening that is the shaming, but shame 
seems to be a pulsation from within that happens from internal and external prompts, but that it's a, it's a cluster, it's an affective cluster. That's shame. Humiliation is a more, I'm always going to say commedia dell'arte, but I, I don't really quite mean that, but you know, like the f Giotto frescoes or something, it's, a, you know, the Annunciation, humiliation. It's a, it's a scene. It's a, it's a script. It's a, a tableau. That's the word. It's a tab. Humiliation is the entire tableau in which shame and shaming can take, can have a part. So there are scenes of humiliation. And yes, you can say, I felt humiliated. And so there is the, you know, it, we don't, there doesn't have to actually be a difference between shame and humiliation, but if I, since I wrote a book about humiliation, I wanted it to be less an exploration of psychological, the psychology of shame, and more, which Eve Sedgwick and Sylvan Tompkins and many, many, many other uh, critical theorists have written superbly about, but to think a little bit more about the imagery of it. Thank you for the question, Zelda. Um, Simone and I each have another topic slash question, and then we're going to ask you to read a passage that we all love um, to conclude. Um, my question goes back to the tingling of the spine. Um, my, I think your reader can have that, mm -hmm. even if you don't feel yourself to be performative enough to get that much as a writer in your room. Readers do experience it, and I, I want to ask you to read from an essay and figure it out from Corpse Pose, um, a section, which is to say a paragraph. Mm -hmm. I guess my transition to it is it gave me <laughs> tingles in the I'm spine, so but it, it Im it's embedded, embedded in it is this idea, where did you ever get the idea that anyone's relation to literature could come without fleshly exactions? And it explains it, and I wonder if you could read it and then we can talk about Certainly. it. It's that one, obviously. Get ready for tingles, people. Can I read the sentence right before? Just so that you can do whatever you want. Thing? You are the fellow. Okay. Okay. I owe to the stillborn child for oh any good fortune I've had as someone granted a privileged and seemingly unhindered relation to literacy and to literature. I owe to the stillborn child for if he'd survived his birth. I recall learning that he'd been strangled by the umbilical cord. I'd be the third son, not the second. In my life as fable, only my mother's second son is the child destined to have a felicitous and unencumbered relation to literature. And then here's the paragraph. Does my relation to literature seem unencumbered? Do I seem a serene-tempered representative of literature's pleasures rather than its ordeals, curfews, and solitary confinements? Where did you get the idea that anyone's relation to literature could come without fleshly exactions? When I write, I'm on the verge of physically exploding. Hands sweating, I'm hunched over, poised to attack or defend like a raptor or a cowering dog. Language compels me to sweat, slaver, tremble, squeeze. My body is a bloody washcloth I'm systematically wringing. Sentences demand aviation. Adrenaline and anxiety prov provide horsepower for my freakish, impossible flight. Caught in a schizogenic double bind, I use language to flee language. To write, I must burn imagination's mansion to the ground, like Rochester's thorn field in Jane Eyre. The guilt and depletion I feel after writing is an arsonist's hangover of remorse. An arsonist who knows that he has destroyed the last house on earth, or the last house that his paltry book of matches has the power to destroy. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, Wayne, sentences demand aviation. First of all, fabulous way to begin a sentence. Is it begins a sentence that takes off in flight. This is that, this is why we were admiring James, you know. That is hard to accomplish in a paragraph that is about a kind of doing something that hurts, but you need 
that is demanding of the body, but you need to do. That's just praise. I don't know how you want to respond to no, that. No, I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for it. I can say I remember writing it. The essay is called Corpse Pose. I wrote it to give at a conference at NYU, a more academic conference that I'm ever usually asked to participate in. And it was on essentially on the a conference on the demise of literature. And there were a, a lot of... Helen Siksu was a keynote speaker. I mean, it was a very elevated event. And so I had... The, at the writing of the essay, which I did pretty quickly a few days before. On a flight. Hand, on an, I guess you were, f sentences demand aviation. But long flying. hand in notebooks or in, in on a legal pad. And it was, I mean, I, th the, I think that I get in the meta mode when I'm writing something in what feels to me like a state of emergency. And it's not just there were various things in my life going Your on. Your stepfather died. Exactly that I that I talk about. So there really was the question: Am I going to fly? Am I going to go to this conference or fly to California? But I'm writing this talk, and so uh, being in the in when are we not in the midst of an emergency? If you, as I said yesterday, if you have a if you're in fifth grade and you have a seminar paper seminar paper, you don't have seminars in fifth grade. If you're in fifth grade and you have a, a report to on, do, the, on the salmon on salmon due the next day, <laughs> you're in a panic. And the, the, the panic around writing and its due date is built into the delivery system of, of writing. And so there's always an it's always an emergency when you're writing. And the, when I get more meta and maybe more uh performative within the sentences themselves where the sentences describe themselves is where the emergency feels keenest and therefore you use language to flee language yeah and there's nothing wrong with that kind of fleeing your therapist would say please stop fleeing things mm -hmm. but you as a writer say no i need to flee things yeah. the thing i need to flee in is language, language. Yeah. in language it's lovely tingles thank you thank you al simone I keep feeling like there's no need for me to ask a question. Though. <laughs> we love your questions. <laughs> but I, so I love this section in Warhol where you talk about masculinity as like empty and like an empty box. Do you, do you want me to read it to you or shall yeah, no, you okay. I? Okay. I'm, I'm still on that page. It's, I want to hear about what you think about this right now. Um, so this says, like Warhol's comic strip heroes, the boxes caricature masculinity giant size largest but in fact they are merely boxes facsimiles at that he may be suggesting that manhood is a loud fib masculinity if reduced to an abstract form is empty and null as a box slang for female genitals a fact that miss warhol devoted to the words pussy i love to say pussy everybody knows this and beaver would not have overlooked. Masculinity as a system fails just as ketchup rarely pours. Even if the largest selling ketchup in the world were here in a bottle before him, Warhol couldn't manage to make the blood flow out the recalcitrant tip. Damn. Whoa. Thank you. Thank you. But then you, you have another essay in Figure It Out called my masculinity remix yeah. and i'm just really curious about whether these ideas about masculinity and gender and sexuality how have they bounced around for you a vast fatigue is one line in this small poem in my masculinity did i once call it a vast summational fatigue huh why well, I, I can st i also am still on the page of the vast summational <laughs> fatigue a fatigue about the need to to sum up, mm. uh, but the masculinity page I'm still on because it's like all rock solid concepts, and masculinity is one of those that just uh, is a concept that announces itself as rock solid. Of course, it's full of grit and fissures, and it so masculinity interests me sexually obviously maybe obviously and as somebody who's lived in and out of the term as a kind of in a kind of inner exile within masculinity but not too much of it just having having a kind of 
I'd say, an on-again, off-again relation to masculinity in terms of my embodiment and mm. behavior and everything. So I've, I've had a, chan a chance to taste masculinity's fugitivity on the street and in the classroom and everywhere. Oh, what I'm does always, it taste like? I'm always, I'm always doing experiments in masculinity just like walking down the street. And so that interests me. But then when I see it performed or embodied, I'm always, so, that's why I think the first essay in Figure It Out is called, Do You Want Me to Touch It? Or what's it called? Do You Want to Touch It? Do You Want to Touch It? Mm -hmm. It's when I see masculinity in any of its guises, I do feel like, uh, like I'm in Eden, but the names haven't been given yet. And, I, and, and I, that's why I have another essay called like Eric Stubble or why I said in class yesterday, it always perplexes me that people walk around with secondary sexual characteristics and they don't have, they don't discuss them all the time. It's so bizarre. We're not supposed to talk about it. So I'm always, <laughs> so masculinity is r really great to dilate on. Mm. Right on. I'm like <laughs> there seems to be affirmation of that in the audience. Uh, Wayne, we're going to, sa sad to conclude because this is just so fabulous, um, by asking you to read the last long paragraph of the Warhol book. And just to set it up, this is a moment where many readers realize that either all along or at least at this point, you're thinking about yourself or maybe later after you realize that this was your mode, you could have been thinking about yourself. There is, a, it's, a, it's a praise of work, a kind of work that's persistent and not always, up, not always the best, but it, it's, you do it and you stay, right? Mm -hmm. And it's associated with the word fabrication, which is such a Warholian word, but it turns out to be a good word for your work. Fabrication, not in the sense of lying, a little bit like fictionalizing, but fabricate to make things, poesis, right? And that, that is a democratic. So you're making a, a, you're politicizing Warhol in a way that a lot of people think, oh, no, 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 he wasn't. You're doing that, and you're also talking about what you want to do with your life, and it makes us feel that we want to get to work. It's the very end of the book, so you close the book and you go to work and fabricate something. I and it's, it. it's a <laughs> triumph. And so we're going to conclude having you read that last, last long paragraph. So I thank should, you I, in advance. I, thank you for that. And I just want to say I have a little trepidation because I've I never. This is the reissue of the book, and I never was sent it to proofread or anything. Mm. And I know that when the British edition paperback came out, there was an embarrassing typo on the first page. I say that. Warhol had a puling comma. There's another adjective, and they wrote it as in, in the British edition. It was puking, oh. which, and and I'm still I did. I, there were other errors in the book, and I still have a dream of that I'm seeing weird upside down versions of the Warhol book. So I'm actually I'm praying that this paragraph. Pretty, I think, it's, you think clean. it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here goes. It is false to say that Andy Warhol left nothing behind. He left behind his own example, the gestures and actions of a comic, heroic life. He'd rather have been called a heroine, but he was less Lois Lane and more Superman, transforming his alien self into a costumed metropolitan ubiquity. As well known for his odd verbal style as for his art, he stands before us as a formalist, an abstract thinker who reformed the way we see concepts, names, species, and categories. He was an organization man, interested in organisms, in originality, in organs, and in how the mind organizes cognition and memory. By collecting and socializing, by making amused cameo appearances, by producing abundant sculptures, paintings, prints, drawings, films, photographs, videos, time capsules, and books, Andy organized and boxed the world into digestible units, modular perceptual containers that can be stacked, repeated, and counted, and that might last forever. Above all, he was a maker, in love with productivity. Without apparent self-consciousness or inhibition, he produced ceaselessly. The seed of great art is impulse, not restraint. 
Andy wanted art to be easy, but only so that he could make more of it and more quickly. Easy street, easy art. He wanted to ease, to lubricate the wheels of production, to make fabrication a more accessible, democratic, and open-hearted realm of conduct. Enough of war, of rivalry. Warhol's practice suggests that art can be as direct, pacifying, and clarifying as a cool glass of water, what Ed Hood in My Hustler calls a water cocktail. <laughs> it is not heroic to deprive the world of the artifacts one has the ability to make. Warhol did not hold back his largesse. He could have truly retired from painting. He could have fired all the kids in the factory and closed it down. He could have moved to a tropical island and paid for the company of boys. He could have hired bodyguards and become a recluse. Instead, he stayed in New York, walked its streets, and worked. In a time of artistic meanness, when creators stint posterity by refusing to produce and by masquerading their drought as good manners, Warhol threw away decorum and worked. He was one of the most magnanimous producers of the 20th century, putting art forward again and again, working to salvage work, his favorite category, and to teach us in a deathless didactic act that incarnation is hard labor with no time left over for love. Wayne Kestenbaum. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Simone. Thank you, Zach, for helping. Thanks, Zelda, for the great intro. Thanks to Sophia. And most of all, this has been so fabulous. Let's thank our third Writer's House Fellow of 2023, Wayne Kestenbaum. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you, my friends. Uh, we have copies of Wayne's books. Wayne will be here if you want him to inscribe either a copy you already own or one that you just bought. We'll stay here for a little bit. Come back to the Writer's House very soon. Everything is free. Everything is open to anyone. There is no card swipe at the front door. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for today. Um, My pleasure. I have Susan Sontag to thank.